All right, everybody, welcome to Virtual Bourbon. My name is Steve Akeley. I own a company called the ABV Network, and we do a lot of these type of events. Uh, we used to do live in-person events a lot more than we do now. I uh, don't really have the opportunity to do so. So we started picking up and doing these virtual events and they've worked out pretty well. It's uh, we've met a lot of new people and things like that. And I see some new faces on here today. So welcome, appreciate you, you, you being here with us and check us out. We do a lot more than just the events. We're into podcasts and all those type of things. We actually have about 15 podcasts dedicated to bourbon. So you can listen to those or read our blogs or our e-magazine uh, that we've got over at abvnetwork.com. So please uh, check that out. Uh, this series is called the Dusty Series. It's uh, Wes Hardens. He uh, actually is an active person who tries to find old bourbon. So that's been kind of his specialty to find some of the old picks. He came up actually with this idea to do this series. So I thought it was great, kind of really took a different turn for us. And once he said to do that, uh, he was like, I want to do that one. I was like, well, and then we really started doing a bunch of different tastings and it really took off from there. So Wes was, was really at ground zero for us as we transitioned to those live events, to doing more things on Zoom and stuff like that. So with that, I'd like to introduce Mr. Wes Harden. He's going to tell us about the one that he has for you guys today. Hey, Wes. Hi, guys. How you doing? Good, good. All right. Thanks, uh, everyone, for joining. So this is a pretty cool one um, uh, for a lot of reasons. One, uh, it's it's uh, the old Taylor. It's from uh, a 1968 decanter. Uh, the decanter is um, uh, built in the shape of uh, the Castle Distillery, which has now uh, been resurrected as Castle Key. Um, so it's uh, it's a good uh, it's a good one to do for a couple of reasons. Uh, of course, E. H. Taylor is a is a huge iconic name in in the bourbon industry. Uh, he's probably one of my favorite historical bourbon uh, personalities, and just the story of you know kind of the wheeling dealing, uh, sometimes in a good way, sometimes in a bad way, businessman that he was. Yeah, uh, he was at the forefront uh, of a lot of uh, at the time. Uh, you know, kind of industry changing events, uh, most uh, specifically the Bottle and Bond Act. You know, he didn't do it alone, obviously, but he was uh, one of the, the people spearheading the, the Bottle and Bond Act. Uh, he, he had his ups and downs, you know, with uh, different business ventures. Uh, some people consider him a, a brilliant businessman. Uh, some people consider him an often failed businessman, but uh, he was one of those guys that you know, if he got into a business and it kind of didn't go the way that he wanted, he, he found his way out of it, uh, not always to his benefit, but he always seemed to, to land on his feet and he was very innovative. Uh, so, it, you know, it's one of these where we could probably sit here for two to three hours and do nothing but talk about uh, kind of the life and history of, of Colonel Taylor and this whiskey. What I want to do is kind of Reader's Digest version it uh, and kind of talk more about uh, his time uh, once he built uh, what is now the Castle and Key, but was the old Taylor Distillery, because ultimately what we're going to be sampling tonight is a direct representation of what they were producing there towards uh, the end of their heyday, um, you know, before they shut it down. So uh, for anybody that doesn't know, uh, Colonel E.H. Taylor, uh, he was uh, he was born in 1830. He died in 1923. So he lived a pretty, uh, pretty long life. Uh, he was into a lot of things. He was actually uh, mayor of Frankfurt. He was obviously a bourbon pioneer. Uh, he was a state representative at one time. Uh, and one kind of weird fact that a lot of people don't know or they just don't put the names together, uh, he was the grandson of President Zachary Taylor. And that's something I didn't know for a long time. But uh, over the years, as I've read through uh, some articles and dug into some of the history, it's just kind of another one of those weird kind of cool facts about the guy. Uh, he started and owned seven different distilleries throughout his career. Probably the biggest, most successful was the OFC distillery, which ended up today is now the Buffalo Trace, but it ended up being the George T. Stagg uh, distillery. There was a uh, distillery that was pretty prominent back in pre-prohibition called the Carlisle distillery. And then obviously the one we're really interested in is the old Taylor distillery uh, there in Frankfurt, right there on Glens Creek, uh, next to the Old Crow uh, Distillery, which is obviously defunct now. Um, he's, uh, you know, he kind of rubbed elbows and 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 worked with um, Oscar Pepper, Dr. James Crow, uh, John McBrayer, uh, Judge William McBrayer, W. F. Bond. 
Uh, he worked uh, with a lot of those guys and he was really uh, revolutionary in kind of the bourbon public relations and packaging and promotion of his bourbon uh, and really the, the old Taylor distillery. Uh, and, and if any, if anyone hasn't uh, been there in the past, and if you have, it, it's probably run down. I don't think there's anybody here that was running around uh, to the distillery in the sixties. Uh, but if you've been there since the resurrection to castle and key uh, it, it's like a, it's like a bourbon tourist destination to be honest with you it's it's literally the the entire grounds and where it sits like nestled right on glens creek uh, it's just an amazing place and he and he built it specifically uh for uh to, to for it to be a bourbon destination so he that was really the first distillery that was built and purpose to be a, a destination uh probably i don't know if he ever envisioned it would be quite a tourist uh, attraction like it is today, but back in the day when, you know, there, there wasn't uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of things to do. People went and saw the world and saw the U S and, and saw different places. And uh, he built that thing uh, specifically to, to bring people there when people would, uh, when uh, people would tour there, they could picnic on the grounds out by the river. Uh, he would actually, they, when they got there, everyone was given a complimentary 10th pint bottle of old taylor bourbon yeah that that's that's like the ultimate find isn't it to find it one is. of those original one tenth because you know that's what he used to hand them out as they're getting off the train uh, yeah. right there in front of the distillery uh, that that to me is one of the holy grails of bourbon finding one of those uh, yeah yeah it, it'd just be cool it was it's uh it's kind of cool because if you go there today to gas on key uh the the train tracks in front of the distillery in front of the castle are still there like they've mm -hmm. left as much of uh, what's structurally sound and safe, you know, for people both working and visiting to be on the grounds are still there. Uh, it still has, uh, it had and still has the longest brick house in the world. Uh, the unfortunate part of it is only kept one set of doors. So it's a very long uh, walk if you're uh, in the job of rolling barrels in and out of uh, uh, the rack house. It's, uh, it's the world's longest. They've got uh, he built uh, a separate building, which was like an entertainment building, and they hosted weddings and family get-togethers. Like it was a for the time, it was you know the bourbon's version of like a, a small bourbon Disney now, Disneyland. There's uh, you know there's just a lot of features uh, there. They've got the uh, they've got the big well uh, where they hosted parties. It's got the whole uh, walkway around. It's keyhole shaped, so it was it's an event center, but it also uh, help supply uh, water into uh, the distillery uh, to mix with the mash. So you got the limestone water, you got the limestone well, and 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 the and the peristyle, and it's just uh, a really cool place. So he uh, uh, he built that thing. Oh God, he built that thing right after Prohibition, uh, and then it, it was uh, it was a pretty. Uh, pretty powerful uh, distillery as far as volume. Uh, one of the things of that you can tell with the old Taylor versus a lot of your older bourbons, even when the bourbon um, kind of glut hit in the late 60s, 70s and 80s, and you, the distillery shut down in 72, but obviously they had all that age stock uh, setting around uh, after they stopped production and Old Taylor is one of the few older brands that really didn't bottle anything over about eight years old. Most of the old Taylors uh, that you find out there are four year, six year, eight year. I think there's a, a very few like 101 proof that are like eight to 10 year. Uh, but a lot of the old Dusties you'll see that are 12, 15, 18 year because those people set and set and set and waited for uh, some of this whiskey to uh, to move based on the demand being low, but even in you know the the late mid late seventies and the early eighties, once they were finished, kind of siphoning off all the aged uh, spirits there, uh, none of that really set around uh, to become any uh, really old age, which is a testament to uh, the popularity. Even when bourbon wasn't that popular, you can tell that Old Taylor was still one of the brands that they kept uh, uh, they kept purchasing. Um, he died actually right uh, during, I think it was 23. So he died right during uh, 
that whole prohibition mm-hmm. stage. And, uh, you know, United Dis- or uh, National Distillers bought the uh, bought the distillery and, and, and kept running it. Uh, and it's just some of the uh, some of the most sought after um, highly rated dusty bourbon that's out there. So uh, he was a, he's definitely a pioneer. Uh, he kind of uh, was, a, you know, if you if we had to do kind of a, a Mount Rushmore of bourbon uh, barons, for lack of better terms, I think he's definitely in the conversation. Of, I, I think he is too. You know, Wes, I, I, I always look at Colonel Taylor as being the, the person who ushers in modern bourbon. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, before Colonel Taylor got involved, you're talking about rectifiers. You're talking about, there's no real rules to bourbon. So they're making it with buckwheat. They're making it with different, they're just putting bourbon, you know, on, uh, they're selling it as bourbon, but there's nothing around it. So, so the Bottled and Bond Act started to get our arms around exactly what bourbon was. He was key in that. Uh, he started of that whole touristy thing they also did a lot of branding and promotion so you can find old promo items from the you know late 1800s early 1900s from uh you know colonel taylor uh promoting his brands again stuff that people weren't doing back then so i feel like he's just he, he deserves on the mount rushmore as the as the face representing modern bourbon i mean i agree like pioneers I, and stuff like that but yeah he that's where he belongs yeah you know you're gonna have to throw you know you're going to have to throw one of the beams up, I guess, by default, maybe it's Jim, but mm-hmm. uh, you're going to have to throw one of the beams up there. I think you definitely throw Colonel Taylor up there. And then, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a crap shoot from there of, uh, of who you want to throw as far as from the other, the, the big, you know, the, the big guys. But uh, I think he definitely deserves a spot up there. It's, it's there's, yeah. there's no doubt about it. There's a conversation that's a, a good bourbon conversation. I always say one of them should just be a farmer. You're just represent not a specific person because so many, uh, so much of the whiskey making was refined, was learned by people just making whiskey at the end of the season on their farms. And that's what really bourbon is. That's what everyone's th- that aha moment where bourbon was invented and there's no such thing. It yep. evolved over time. A lot of people contributed to it. And that's why, you know, some, you know, some of the uns on the Mount Rushmore should be known, but I think there should be one that's just generic. That's just kind of uh, the, 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 the pioneer or the person who, you know, brought that still uh, over from the old country and, uh, you know, carried it on their back as they're riding across the plains and that type of thing. So, yeah, you could eat, you know, and, and not to get off tangent, but you could even make an argument for Joseph Dant and the log steel. Like he's yeah. that farmer guy who had to start off with distilling out of a log for God's sake, until he was able to, yeah build his you know his steel his distillery so yeah there's there's all kinds of examples of that but you know to, to get back to old taylor you know uh, it was built in 1887 uh and it is also built with uh, a lot of features that at the time uh were considered kind of um new age uh very uh very thought forward as far as the way it was built. So it was one of the first distilleries that had copper fermentation bank uh, tanks. Uh, they had state-of-the-art grain equipment. So they they mashed their, they, they ground their own grains there before it went into the mash. Uh, they had column stills. Uh, they had a first of a kind steam heating system uh, to help the maturation process. Uh, they had that longest rack house. Uh, it, they, they were just, um, it was like I said, it was kind of the bourbon version of a Disneyland. It was like things you'd never seen in the distillery uh, were kind of brought into that. And and you give credit to him, you know, he really doesn't take credit for inventing a lot of or any of that stuff on his own. But as a savvy businessman, will he learned a lot of the techniques from all of these people that he that he hung out with uh, and 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 was dealing with. And if you take a look at the other distilleries that he owned or was a part of. Uh, throughout his career, up until he built the old Taylor distiller, distillery, uh, he worked with uh, the best. And, you know, today bourbon is a big nationwide product, but back in back in the 1800s, it was very localized to uh, Kentucky and the Ohio Valley region. So, you know, all those people uh, were kind of a smaller, close-knit group compared to kind of how widespread they are today. So they had no choice but to to learn and kind of uh, take ideas and, and kind of brainstorm together. 
Yeah. And, you know, there's really only one blemish on Colonel E.H. Taylor's record, it's, but it's a pretty big one. So Colonel E.H. Taylor, everything you read about him, he was a real stand up guy, believed in quality, uh, wanted to make the best products he could. He, uh, you know, was the bottle and bond act. Everything isn't great for the, the distilleries in there. There's some rules that, you know, that force them to adhere to as well that cost more money. Uh, you know, he's famous for doing things over the top. He wanted brass hoops around his barrels just because they, they look good. But, you know, the problem is those things blow up. They didn't, they didn't realize that they don't, you know, they, they will start breaking. So, so, uh, but everything you hear about him is such a, a person of honor, you know, he's a banker. So people trusted him with his money back in the days, you know, before federally insured banks, you have to trust the person. So he was that type of person that had that, but when he got in trouble, how he ended up losing what was OFC and then became George T. Stagg story today, Buffalo Trace is he, uh, got in over his head. He, he ran a, an organization with a lot of overhead and their production didn't keep up with what they're selling. So he starts selling the same barrels a couple different times and things like that. He, he's selling more than the than inventory that he has. It finally blows up for a while. You can get away with that for a while because you got new stuff coming in and you just get it out. You just, you, you put out fires. You're continually putting out fires as this is imploding. It's like an Enron type of thing. And ultimately uh, it all comes crashing down and Colonel E.H. Taylor, rather than wanting to face the music, he leaves the country. He goes to Europe, just gets gets the hell out of Dodge, if you will, and uh, leaves his family and everything and just disappears. And that left George T. Stagg to clean up that mess. He did. He cleaned it all up, uh, you know, took care of everything. But uh, and he and he and, and Taylor didn't get along anyway. So when Taylor came back, Stagg then owned the company. He left Taylor with one share in the in the in the company. Yep. So he was still an owner, but only with one share. And he was uh, he reported to George T. Stagg, which he hated. And he had to do it for a couple of years because he's still upside down financially. But then when he got himself back on his feet, he left and would become a politician, then would go own his own distillery. But that's a crazy part of it, uh, of, of that whole story. Yeah, it's it is. And it's you know, that was that was, um, you know, he, if you think about it, if he was operating the way he operated some of those businesses in today's world, he would be your modern day typical on paper millionaire that's gone bankrupt multiple times. <laughs> right, right. You know, that, that, that's kind of the, the level of of businessman he was. But in, in the time when there weren't bankruptcy laws and all these other uh, type of things. He, he was able to, to slither out and maneuver around and get into these better positions eventually some sooner than others. But yeah, that was the, that was his big loss was, you know, that was a, that at the time that OFC, which became George C. Stagg, which on and on uh, was the premier, you know, large producing uh, right up there with, with beam. Yeah. Uh, and he lost, uh, he owned that thing and lost every bit of it, walked away with nothing besides yeah. the one share. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but it's, it's movie worthy. It's, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, I, I think there's a story there that goes beyond just simply bourbon fans. You can make it interesting enough where, you know, the regular population at large likes it. I always say it's, it's between him and, um, and George Remus. Those are the two movies that need to be made out of bourbon. Yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, I think you have to do the Remus before because you have, you know, he was so involved in the, in the bootlegging portion and all of that. And I think you, it, with that type of movie, you, you pull in more non-bourbon people and kind of get people used to that. And then you can bring in something, you know, because really each Taylor, most all of his, you know, the main part of his career was all pre-prohibition. I mean, he, he, he only lived to, to 1923. So right. uh, it's a, uh, yeah, it's, it, I agree with you. There are two that, you know, if you just told their story without a bunch of extra crazy over the top stuff and just told the story, uh, yeah, I think they would definitely make uh, very popular movies slash series, you know, whatever someone wanted to do with it for sure. Yeah, I agree. No, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, the bourbon uh, that we're tasting tonight and, and again, we, you know, we can, we can do an entire another show about his entire career up until he built this distillery. The unfortunate part for him was he, he had to wait so late in life because of some of these bad business deals where by the time he built this distillery and then you count prohibition, then all of a sudden he, he didn't only got to, uh, he really only got to enjoy it for a handful of years, but um, he's definitely uh, to me, he's on the Mount Rushmore of, of bourbon barons and bourbon pioneers for sure. And, uh, definitely an innovator and uh he's uh his bourbon that was made in his distillery at old taylor 
uh, is still a, a very hard, dusty bourbon to find, and is definitely one that's uh, that's sought after. Uh, but what we're drinking tonight, uh, and if anybody has any questions, stop, raise a hand, do whatever. Uh, if you want to talk about any more of the history and have questions, but I think what we really want to do is start kind of nosing and, and tasting this. So this is, uh, again, this is a 1968 uh, decanter, uh, the Castle decanter. It is 86 proof, which is pretty common for that time period. Uh, for the most part, most of the old tailors were at 86 proof. Uh, there is a, they did have uh, a handful of bottlings, which are really tough to find and they're super expensive. Uh, surprisingly, he did have some at 101 proof, which I really thought was strange. Uh, and then there are some at 80 proof. So towards the end is they're just trying to, uh, to make bourbon more palatable for uh, the clear spirits uh, world at the end of, uh, you know, in seventies, eighties and into the nineties before Bean took over. Uh, there are some 80 proof running around, but for the most part, it's 86. Other than bottled and bond, there's quite a bit of 100 proof out there. But this one is uh, at 86, and it's basically four years old. Most of the uh, four-year minimum, most of the decanters have four to six year in it. Uh, it's not all four-year, but it, from an age statement standpoint, it's uh, typically known to be four to six with a little bit of seven in it. Uh, but yeah, let's, uh, anybody has any questions, let's start nosing it. Kind of want to see what everybody thinks. Yeah, and we got a small enough group. You guys can open up your mics. Yeah, absolutely. Free. You know, we like your comments. Uh, sometimes when it's a bigger group, we're better with the, the chat section, but not tonight. We, we certainly, if you've got a, a comment you want to make, just make it. What do we want to talk about on the nose? The nose is pretty darn good. I'll say that. Yeah, so to, to me, um, without giving it away, the there's a... There, there's a specific nose on uh, a lot of the National Distillers Dusty, specifically Old Taylor, Old Crow, uh, which though if anybody's been to, uh, to either of those uh, distilleries, they're literally right beside each other. Like if you didn't have that weird fence and tree line, you would think it was one gigantic uh, long distillery right there on Glens Creek. Uh, but Old, Old Crow and Old Taylor to me, the, the National Distillers uh, uh, bourbon uh, of those has kind of a, a very distinct nose and a very distinct flavor. I want to see if anybody gets that. I don't want to put it in people's head, but I'm kind of curious to what you guys think. All right. What are we thinking on the nose? So I, I decanted this about 40 minutes ago. I poured it and it's really, I'm, it's sweet, fruity. I'm I, I want to say I'm getting a peach, peach, <laughs> but I don't know. Well, it's definitely really sweet. I mean, you, when you said fruity, yeah. I mean, like fruity pebbles, uh, cereal. It's definitely very, very sweet on the nose. Mike, what do you think on the nose on this one? Yeah, like a, like a warm caramel sauce is the first thing I get. It just it yep. smells dense. Yep. Yep. So Mike, Mike hit the, to me, mo a lot of these national distiller dusties, especially old Crow and old Taylor. And it could be a deal where, you know, the, the, you know, those two distilleries are so very close that over time it, it's possible that you know, the yeast kind of morphed into kind of, you know, they kind of treated with, you know, yeast is a, obviously uh, it's a natural, substance and it doesn't have to be extremely close to start taking uh you know the traits of the environment plus uh those two distilleries right there on the glens creek and down in that valley just they they age a little differently but most of these to me are very sweet and very much that to me it's a little less caramel but more of like a butterscotch like a lot of these are like sweet butterscotch bombs uh, to me, but it's uh, with a little bit of fruit in there, but you guys have picked up exactly what I get most of the time when, when I'm drinking these. Okay. Well, cheers gang. Let's give this thing a taste and see cheers, guys on, on the palate. One thing about the palate uh, to me is it doesn't have a long finish, but it doesn't have a short finish. And for an 86 proof, it's got a nice little, uh, it's not a burn. It's just a nice little Kentucky hug on the end of it. Yeah. 
yeah, that, that comes back on the back end. You don't get it when you first first yep. take it in, but it comes in on the back. Right there in the back of the throat, you get that nice little uh, drop. It To me, the taste is a nice balance of that sweetened fruit with a little bit of spice on the back end. Yeah, there's definitely a little spice to it, but yeah, it's kind of sweet butterscotch sauce. I mean, it's it's good. Very good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's um, it's really good. What what do we, what do we got from the Robinsons there? I was just thinking it 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 would be wasted on on a newbie, but this is a kind of this is a kind of bourbon that wouldn't scare off somebody new. I mean, it's true. It, it, it's real balanced and uh, yeah, doesn't have a whole lot of bite to it, but it's it, it's got a lot of just flavor. Enough, yeah, you know that that's you know that's very one of the things we talk about on these dusty events is outside of really outside of course wild turkey is is 101 proof i mean they had some 80 proof when they were trying to get rid of stuff but in the dusty world outside of things like old granddad had and still has a 114 uh other than bottled and bond you know bourbon back before really the 2000s back uh, before then was not designed to, even though I, I would like to have had a lot of that at barrel strength, it was designed to be pleasant and approachable and not to scare people off. And it was designed, in my opinion, to draw in new customers. Uh, even when, even in its heyday, you know, if you look at all those old bourbon ads, you know, you see them out on the internet, people post them all the time. Every one of those ads somewhere in the nomenclature says, smooth and easy to drink and you know it, it, it's never barrel strength and big and bold it's always easy and approachable and come on in and let let it in and that's uh that's part of the reason you don't see anything much over one uh, 100 to 114 proof and it's uh that they they crafted these bourbons to be very approachable and, and not kind of uh, be offensive for lack of better terms yeah yeah, and that, that's the funny thing, too, about the, the old days is, you know, we think about all this great bourbon that we enjoy going back. And again, there's not anything high proof like we're used to today. Uh, but, you know, back in the day, too, most of them, you know, drank it with something. So, you, you know, you listen to Elmer T. Lee talk, you know, in that, that Kentucky thing. He talks about, you know, he likes to drink uh, uh, his bourbon each night with a little lemon lime soda. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, very common. Uh, you know, you hear Booker uh, even even drinking uh, with some mixers and stuff like that too. Not just uh, we always think about oh, he loved the high proof because he had the, the Bookers, but he, he also mixed his stuff up. So, and I think it was back in the day when you know it was actually you know if you were at a high enough level uh, at an office or a workplace, you know, people still had you know decanters and mini bars at work where it was okay to go to lunch and have a drink. You know, like you can't you can't go to work and function properly drinking 136 <laughs> proof bourbon on a day-to-day basis, but an 80 or an 86 proofer, can you have a couple of fingers of it at lunch and function the rest of the day? I could, I mean, most everybody on most everybody I know can. So, you know, it was, it was just a different time and a different uh, era where I think, you know, drinking at, you know, every meal and doing, it was just, uh, you know, it's the same thing with smoking. Everybody smoked everywhere they went, smoked on airplanes, smoked in restaurants, smoked in the office. It's just a, a different time and uh, approachable bourbon was the, the, the thing of, of that time period. All right. I'd like to get everybody involved in, uh, you know, some tasting notes here. So I'll just start on the, what's on my screen. So Mike, you're, you're up first. You're the first one on my screen. What are your thoughts I, I, as you I, taste this one? I get get the same same on the the palate as I do on the on the nose. I get the the caramel sauce, the vanilla, a um, little bit of corn. It, again, it's dense, but it's it's got a there's a it's an odd viscosity. It's like it doesn't stay together. It's like it's 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 thick and then it, it dissipates, and then mm-hmm. it left with a like a dusty corn finish. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nice. Uh, Kent, how about you? Well, I I was just telling both Nick and Nate, I don't really get the butterscotch or the caramel. Okay. Um, I, I've had a bit of a cold, you know, the Florida thing back to here, but um, on the nose, I'm, I'm getting the hint of spearmint. Mm-hmm. Um, and then on the, on, on the taste, I, I, I still pick up a little bit of that spearmint in, in front and then it goes to a real earthly 
kind of a limestone flavor to it. Um, what stands out to me the most though is the mouthfeel. You get that little burst up in front, but you get a good, it fills your whole mouth with the finish. It doesn't go too far in the back, but when when it hits that top of your mouth, it, it quickly is the side of your mouth and it's a good finish. It's not, I mean, for an 86 proof, it's, yeah. it's a really good finish, which I enjoy. Um, I did have to swirl it a lot to get the, uh, the, the old taste or the old smell out of it and, mm -hmm. and putting a lot of that air into it is when I started getting that spearmint smell. So, Gotcha. Yeah. Well, that's worth trying to swirl it a little bit. See what, see what happens. See what happens. All right, Nate, how about you, man? What are your thoughts as you drink this one? Well, <clears throat> So I like, I know you guys are all saying like this, the sweetness, which, which I can kind of get that on the nose and it kind of tastes that way on the front end, but I don't know, to me that fades pretty quickly and it almost, it almost seems like, um, on the back end, it seems like, like I, I kind of get that fruitiness that you guys are talking about, but without the sweetness, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It's kind no. of. I, I I tell you, for me on on the finish too, it it, it it I do get the spice to it, so you're getting the the rye, the spice to it, but it's definitely kind of mid palate on back. There's nothing; it doesn't get the front of the tongue or anything like that at all. So, uh, it's definitely unique on the finish. All right, Team Robinson, tasting this one. What do you think? Uh, on on the nose, I going back and after, like after it's been in the in here a little bit i i get the spearmint too mm -hmm. uh, i got i i had a hint of vanilla <laughs> uh-huh oh yeah there's definitely vanilla yeah oh, yeah absolutely yeah. and i i agree with kent that up front you know the the when we first nosed it it was a little bit funky and that all you know that old dusty funky smell but you know the longer it's been open i mean it's just very pleasant yeah yeah, let's find a hundred more of these decanters. I want to make this my everyday drinker. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 more of these, all right. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. this now, is fantastic. It, it's like, okay, I can't wait to taste it. Right, right. Nick, how about you, man? Uh, I, I agree with the the old that everyone's saying, but um, I, I think once, you know, getting past that, I was maybe most struck by, I don't know, um, the incongruity of it, I guess. I, I think I, I got, I, I, don't, I wouldn't have thought of the word spearmint, but kind of something like that, almost a, okay. like a fruity, like yeah. effervescent sort of a um, kind of sweetness in the beginning. Um, but it, I was struck by, I think, the, the incongruity of the taste because it, it tastes very, very earthy to me. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't really sort of get the same, the same sweetness that I smelled. And so that the distinction between those things is I think what, what struck me the most yeah yeah all right mr murphy as you're as you're going through this one tasted a couple times you decanted it you got a little air to it early what are your thoughts as you're drinking this one now yeah so i i didn't get so much the the butterscotch on the nose like i said i, I got fruit when you said fruity pebbles i think that was pretty dead on when i when i said peaches i was thinking like uh canned canned syrupy peaches yeah it really really sweet nose but uh, I did get the butterscotch <laughs> in the palate initially, mm -hmm. and then it has this more of a uh, spicy, woody, earthy finish like everyone else has noticed. And I'll tell you what, this is probably one of my favorite dusties that we've had. I, I agree. I really wow. enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, that's really, really a solid pour for sure. <clears throat> All right, jump over to Warner next. Warner, as you're tasting this, what are your thoughts? Uh, you know, it... <clears throat> What I like about it is that it it carries a lot of flavor with it for you know such a relatively speaking like low proof. Right. And uh, in that way, it really reminds me of some of these like uh, older wild turkey releases. You know the the whiskey's <laughs> older in those, but it has this characteristic of like not being really aggressive like from an alcohol standpoint, but still not feeling wimpy. And uh, so, yeah, you know, those are always welcome. You know, if they don't, those bottles don't last long with me. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like today, uh, you know, if it's just on the shelf, we see 86, we're probably 
turning up our nose to that, but man, this, this shows you how good an 86 can be. Yeah. And, and, and what, and I think one of the big differences is, is back in, back in the, the olden times is what I'll call it. Uh, most, most, not all, but most of, uh, of these bourbon uh, craftsmen, I'll call them, always went into the barrel at a, at a lower proof. And the whole idea was to, to not strip out all the flavor and it allowed them to produce an 86 and an 80 proof that didn't, that didn't taste watered down. So a lot of times today's 80 and 86 proof bourbons have some flavor, but they fade really quickly and they're not as complex. And it feels like they, they went in and stripped all of the flavor out of the grain and then waterproofed it down to 80, 80, 80, 86, and even 90. And, and it just kind of leaves you wanting. And I think that's part of the reason why today's uh, trend is let's get barrel strength. Let's get barrel strength because people uh, through tasting and just through, I think, bourbon communities that felt like, man, if anything under 100 proof today doesn't have any flavor uh, and a lot of it's because they're going in at higher proof. Not everybody. A lot of the craft guys are going in low. Right. Uh, but, you know, they're going in higher proof. They're stripping out some of that natural flavor. And then you're reliant on what you get out of the barrel and the aging, the maturation. And then you take that and you proof it all the way down to 90, 86 and 80. You know, the water washes out the rest of the flavor <laughs> and, and you get that kind of watery taste that you didn't necessarily get with 86 and 80 proofs. Wild Turkey has an 80 proof dusty from back in the 60s, 70s. It's a brown label that if if you were to taste that blind, uh, you probably wouldn't figure it was 101 proof, but you definitely do not figure it to be 80 proof. And it's because they go in with the barrel low and it's just uh, just a different way of, of, of distilling and, and aging and, uh, you know, going into the, the barrel with the lower entry proof. But I think that's uh, part of the reason these dusties seem to hold up from a complexity and flavor standpoint at the lower proofs. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. And the, the, they don't have to lower it as much. And again, you think about that the, to lower that proof, you're adding water and that hasn't been in the barrel aging with it. You're, you know, and that's why you, you take some of those. And I, I swear there's some of those 80 proof bourbons, the, the mouthfeel to me, is like water. It does have a bourbon flavor to it, but the mouthfeel to me, it's like water. There's no heat there at all. Uh, so, so it tastes like bourbon flavored water, some of them. So yeah, not, not pleasant to, on, on those types, but th that's not the case here at all. This is, this has got great fla flavor. It's got a uh, nice finish to it. So it's good. Casey, how about you, man? What are you getting on the flavor on this one? If he's with us, he's not, not live. It's got the glamour shot there, looking good. <laughs> oh, there he is. He's frozen in bourbon bliss. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll we'll come back to him if he can uh, get back online. But Tim Barton, uh, my high school buddy, is here. Tim, you drinking this one, man? I am. Can you hear me, Ike? I can hear you, buddy. What I do you think of this? I definitely taste the vanilla. Yeah, there there you go, man. So. Tim, I grew up with Tim. We went to school for quite a few years, and Tim's not a huge bourbon drinker, so that's been kind of a, a fun to to see him kind of get more into it and showing up at some of the events that I'm at and stuff like that. Kind of getting into it a little bit more. So, uh, but you got a good one here, my friend. That is, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so I appreciate you you're coming on, man. Yeah, sorry, I'm a little late. Oh, that's all right. Yeah, I mean, you missed some of the history, but again, we we recorded all that, so we'll be able to uh, you, you can be able to get caught up after the fact so great that's good one last chance with casey casey you there man i don't know I don't it doesn't know. look like it he's on, on mute and just on the screen so yeah i don't know but i mean as this one sits it just I, I, it holds up so some of these you start losing so much but it's still it's lighter on the nose, but still there, and certainly great on the taste. Well, some about empty. Can I have another uh, pour, please? <laughs> yeah, Wes, send us another round, please. <laughs> I'll find one. All right, that's good. What else do you want to talk about on this one, Wes? I'm just curious if uh, anyone has any questions or has any, uh, I'm obviously not the only person in the world that has any knowledge on the brand or anything. So if anybody else has any interesting tidbits and history or 
discussion points. I'd love to hear some of that. Didn't Taylor, didn't he build that railroad out to um, the distillery just to bring the crowd in from um, Frankfurt? Yeah, it was, it was twofold. It was to, to bring the crowd in uh, for that destination distillery, but it was also uh, to bring uh, the grains and so forth in directly. And so if, you, if you've taken, if you go to Castle and Key and do a tour, uh, those old rail ties are still down. The rails are still down in certain areas. Uh, you can see, to your point, literally the front door of the castle has a little bit of like a, a, a flat porch area. And then you're right there. The rails are right there up against uh, the mm -hmm. front of the castle. But if you follow the rail back through uh, around the garden and through the other portion, it goes back uh, towards the greenhouse and where the, the building they use to, um, uh, to grind all the greens up and, and all that stuff. So it was dual purpose. It was, uh, it was the reason most uh, distilleries wanted to be close to a railroad was to bring uh, to, for shipping purposes uh, back in the day because trail of because train was one of the 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 big or the only major uh, shipping uh, you know he built the thing in in the 1800s so at that time rail rails the way to go if you're going to ship anything yeah bulk you're, you're not thinking well we'll just get a fleet of trucks in here to ship exactly right yeah, so no one had that so yeah, yeah so it was dual purpose it was uh, it was not only to to bring product in and obviously ship product out but it was to uh, to bring uh, the tourists and the guests and I mean, he threw a ton of parties there. I mean, it was just uh, it was the, the bourbon happening place to be. It was uh, party central for the uh, the bourbon world, both local people and people from out of town as well. Yeah, I was also thinking that after uh, James Crow passed away, didn't did Taylor end up with the old Crow distillery for a while? Yep, he did for a while. Uh, he uh, he owned both for a while. There's. There's a lot of, uh, of course, throughout history, a lot of, uh, when you get all these different acquisitions, so, you know, when a lot of, after prohibition, a ton of distilleries went under, a ton of brands went under, a ton of, a ton of labels went dead. Uh, the ones that survived uh, over the years ended up getting, uh, getting eaten up by really the big four. So you've got American Distilling and United Distilling and all those kinds, Shenley, and, and once that happened, you, you've got a lot of these dusties that have these labels. And, and I've actually have an old Taylor in a bottle that says it was distilled at uh, the old Taylor distillery, but it was actually warehoused at the old Crow distillery. So yeah, there was a time, even after he was gone, there was a time national distillers owned both. So they used uh, all the mainly warehousing. They didn't really do any cross distilling pollination, but they definitely did from a warehouse standpoint. I mean, Oak Crow Distillery has massive warehouses, uh, multiple massive warehouses, whereas um, Old Taylor had that one great big large uh, warehouse. They had A, B, and C, A's down, B is still uh, active, and C's pretty large. But yeah, they uh, he did own that for a very short time, and then once he passed. Um, those two kind of separated again until national distillers bought both. Yeah. Yeah. And it's worth going to, uh, you know, I don't know how many people here have visited uh, uh, Castle and Key. Uh, they've done a great job because it was in major disrepair uh, when they picked it up and they've done a great job of kind of bringing it back. Uh, but it still has the, the the look of being an old place. It's not like it's super polished like uh, that. They, they kept it kind of as intact as they could. And it uh, to me, it's just like, I don't know, if, if Walt Disney would have decided another business he wanted to get into was making whiskey, that would have been the place he built right there. Absolutely. Yeah. Has anybody on the call been to the Castle and Key Distillery since they opened? Yeah. Well, just a Kent. Robinson's, have you been? No, we've been to... What? what? Is Come on now. Creek. We've been to Glens Creek. Uh, <laughs> you <laughs> go to Glens Creek before before Castle and Key. Well, we, we went there before oh, Castle yeah. and Key was really operational. Uh -huh. Okay. So uh, we haven't been back since they since they've had it open yet. Yeah. So when when the spring hits and you know we get we get these nice days here where it's sunny and like you know 60, 65. Uh, now, especially because Castle and Key now has their first rye out. So now, previous to really now, if you went on the, the tour, you're really going just to see the grounds and everything. All the tastings were vodka, gin, mixed drinks kind of thing. But now uh, they have their their rye and they should be really close 
I, I would guess it would be this year at some point to, to yeah. release their bottle to. bond. It's got to be this year, right? Yeah, yeah it's got to be, right? We're talking like within a month or so. Yeah, right. it, it's going to be really, really quick. So uh, this spring would be the time for anybody local that hasn't been definitely should go. And if uh, if anybody else on the call that has any plans to come uh, distillery uh, hunting, if you if someone was to ask me what are the best distilleries to go visit, uh, my personal opinion, this is just me. I think the 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 big three, and you'll probably put four. Uh, Castle and Key, just for the history right. and, and that place. I like that. So far, we're uh, we're okay. Yeah, uh, I think you have to go to Buffalo Trace yes. just just because of the products they make, the the size of the grounds and the distillery. Uh, and Freddy. Maker's, Mar Maker's and Market Freddy. and Freddie, <laughs> and the chance of seeing Freddie. Maker's Mark is a must just because it's it's like a country bourbon Disneyland, like it's just out in the middle of nowhere. And it's just a beautiful place. It's got a great restaurant. The fourth one that a lot of people disagree, but I absolutely love the distillery, the scenery, the tour is Woodford. I love that place, which is the old uh, Oscar Pepper distillery. Yeah, pretty setting. Woodford is a must to me. There, there, there's probably 15 that are a must, but to me, if someone said I only can go to four, just me, because I like the history and I like kind of, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of cool ones in Louisville. They're more, you know, they're downtown, so they feel more industrial. Mm -hmm. But if you like going to what you would call, what I call like the uh, the reminiscent kind of bourbon distillery out in the country along the creek, uh, those four are really, really hard to beat. Uh, I, I would wait till spring for Castle and Key personally, because I their botanical gardens and all the the gardens oh, on yeah. the other side of the building yeah. are just fabulous. Yeah, fabulous. it's it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, so Wes, how long was this dusty aged? I, if you said I didn't catch it, uh, it was a four year. Okay. Yep. It was a four year, four year, uh, eighty six proof. And so the you know the other cool thing about it is a lot of not outside of craft. You know, a lot of the the high volume big guys now. So when you think of four year bourbon that's out there in mass quantity today, which this was out there in mass quantity in the time, you're thinking of Jim Beam light label, you're thinking of Evan Williams black label, all good products for what they are. They're not premium products. They're not always designed to for the bourbon aficionado who sips as opposed to a mixer or you know, someone at Brown bags it for lack of better terms. But if you were to, to, to drink four-year-old dusties versus the four-year-old products that non-craft people have today, it's night and day difference. It's, it's not even comparable to me. It's just a different way that uh, they crafted these bourbons back in the day. So it's uh, what you're drinking is that day's version of a four-year bourbon. You know, it's, it's that, it's that time's version of a, a Jim Beam and Evan Williams, uh, whatever the case is. So. Anything else anybody wants to know? I have a couple of questions about upcoming ones. Okay. Um, I, I know next month is the Blantons. Oh, and yeah. I, I also wanted to hear about uh, the March one, the your American Distilling, uh, yep. your so, Bourbon Supreme. Yep. So I'm excited about both of those for different reasons. One, it, it's really hard to, uh, it's difficult. So we, we've done a couple of dusty events where, uh, you know, we tried the 1970s, I think it was early times versus the new version today. Uh, and the problem with that was the proofs are different and they just like the, the current one uh, to Brown Foreman's credit crushed the dusty. That was one where yeah, what they're doing was, today with early times. Yeah. Just beat the, beat the hell out of the, the, the dusty. What I like about the Blantons is, uh, a, uh, the dusty bottles are hard to find, but you can still find them. And Blanton's is still a relatively new product. On the grand scheme of things, you know, the Blanton single barrels uh, started in uh, the 80s. Uh, the one we have is from 91. It's, uh, it, it's really, really hard to find one that's uh, much older than that. Uh, but the one we have is a 91. And they really haven't, uh, you know, it's not one that used to be 80 proof and now it's 110. Like this is a pretty direct comparison 
of how that distillery was making Blanton's originally, you know, within a, the first 10 years and how they're making it today. So that one is uh, is a two sample event. Um, each each uh, participant's gonna get uh, a sample and we're gonna do it blind uh, like we did the- um, Early times. Yeah, the early times, thank you, Steve. But yeah, so that one's gonna be a really direct comparison and it's gonna be very interesting to see how the the voting goes once we and for me i'm excited about it because i've never had one of these so this is my first time having one as well so uh i'm pretty excited about that one so anybody that likes blanton's is a blanton's fan i know it's a very uh, polarizing brand today uh it uh it was one of the first uh first offerings in the bourbon industry of, of single barrel kind of premium one-offs uh and it's held the test of time so i'm interested to see um how a, a 1991 holds up to, uh, I think the bottle I've got is from last year. So a 2020. Yeah. yeah. So what you're, what you're, and again, they're, they're single barrels. So they're always, it's not a direct comparison. It's not like right. you're comparing a, a bourbon of that's you know 30 years older than the other one. That's the exact same because they are single barrels, but we will be able to tell, you know, can we tell a difference in them? That's, that's going to be, maybe we can't, maybe it's like, man, I can't tell which one's the old one, which one's the new one. But then again, maybe we can, and that'll be the fun of it. Can we figure out which is the older one? And is there a difference today? You know, Elmer T. Lee famously picked all those barrels up until his death. He just died, you know, three or four years ago. And uh, up until that time, he'd come in on whatever Tuesday as a retirement gig and come in and pick out which barrels would be uh, actually that's Elmer T. Lee, right? My yeah, it's sorry. Elmer T. Lee. Yeah. Elmer T. Lee. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got I got my single barrels screwed up there. So yeah, but he he actually uh, he actually was picking. If I'm not mistaken, he was picking the Blantons as well. They named it Blantons in honor of mm. Colonel Blanton. But I think he was picking both of their. Those were kind of one of the, the first two single barrel programs they had there. Mm -hmm. So I think he. I, I'll have to check Steve, but I think he was. Yeah. Uh, it'd be part of the history dig I do. But and, I think yeah, and I know I know early on uh, the 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 key person there. Uh, because you know he's the he, he was the master distiller, and you think, well, the master distiller knows all. But you're talking about a, a big distillery with a lot of barrels, and and he went uh, to um, Jimmy Johnson Jr., right. uh, Freddie Johnson's father, and said, "Help me find the good barrels. We got a single barrel uh, product that's coming out. We got to put our best foot forward here." And uh, and Jimmy did that, and it was a big moment in a press conference uh, when when uh, you know uh, he's. Elmer T. Lee, who's the, you're supposed to take credit for everything as a master distiller. I did this. This is my product. You know, he said, you know, Jimmy, Jimmy's the one who found all the barrels. So, yeah. Yep. So excited about the Blantons, uh, mainly for me because I've never had a dusty Blanton. So it's uh, something new that I've never had before, which is exciting. Uh, the other one. Um, so that's a, uh, it's interesting for a couple of reasons. One, it's a, uh, it's a distillery that, um, back prior to really the, the and it's still a it's still an active distillery but it's it's not um, it really doesn't have any premium brands uh but back in the day it, it is an american distilling company was one of the big four uh distilling companies or companies that own distilleries and this big distillery in peoria illinois which is where uh this decanter uh came from were kind of uh they were producing a lot of really good bourbon that really kind of fell under the radar compared to what was happening in Kentucky, obviously. So, you know, Kentucky, you've got all the, the, the name heritage brands and distilleries, uh, but there's a lot of really excellent, actually dusty bourbon that, uh, uh, that came out of that distillery. So uh, I happened upon this decanter. Uh, I'm always looking for different things to do. I, I like to do a mix of well-known brands and products as well as some oddball things that maybe people haven't heard of before I've had a few dusties uh, from this distillery. The ones I've had were flat out amazing. Uh, one of their big products was Walker's Deluxe. There's a lot of Walker's uh, dusties running around. That's yep. one of the big brands. Uh, that's probably the one that everybody kind of knew, but 10 High started there when it was uh, a more <laughs> up and up. It was, a, it was a more highly thought of brand than it is today. Uh, but 10 High started there. There's a, a lot of brands that are now low bottom shelf or even blends. Uh, with grain neutral today that back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and into the 80s were actually considered uh, good solid bourbon. So I saw this one. Uh, it was cool. And I thought I would um, share the offering with everyone. And hopefully we can all learn yeah. something about the American Distilling Company. Yeah, hopefully you guys are interested in that. It's a little bit cheaper one, a little bit easier to find. So 
But I'll tell you what, look at the listing for that. And Wes shot me over a picture too when he poured it out into uh, uh, into the jar that he's got it oh, in. Oh, man. And man, that stuff's beautiful. It's dark. It's crystal clear though. It, it is, you know, you don't, you don't want any cloudiness. Or, there's none of that in there. That, that stuff is, it's beautiful. If you're ever, it reminds if you're me of, it reminds me of, like yeah, it reminds me of a lot of the really dark um, Ezra Brooks decanters from like the 60s and 70s, that really dark, complex uh, bourbon. So I'm excited about that one. And uh, I hope uh, everyone joins in. It's a, just something different. Uh, you know, like I said, I, like I always say, there's tons of old uh, dusty brands from all types of different distilleries. You know, anybody that was on the McCormick um, event we did a few months ago, I never would have thought that that bourbon was as good as it was. I thought it was going to oh, be, yeah. Yeah, actually, I thought surprise. it was going to be rot gut terrible. And it was actually one of the uh, more surprising ones that we've done. So I yeah. think there's just all these little well, hidden favorite. gems. Yeah, it was, a, it was a great one. So there's a lot of these possible hidden gems outside of the mainstream i just like to to mix mainstream with uh, some of the uh, some of the things that maybe people just don't know about and it's uh gives me a chance to do some historical research and and I always like uh reading and researching bourbon history so cool anything else for tonight's event all right what i'll do next i will turn off the recorder we'll say goodbye to our folks that are watching the recording here thanks for attending and hopefully you're enjoying the whiskey as much as we did thanks and i'll turn that off and then we will stick around though wes and i are available if you want to ask us anything it doesn't have to be about tonight's offering it can be just about bourbon world or whatever you want to know <laughs>